Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. This is the City of San Diego Commission on Police Practices Ad Hoc Transition Planning Committee meeting of uh, Friday, August the 20th, 2021. Um, I will do roll from the uh, Zoom attendance box. Uh, I'm Doug Case. I am the first vice chair of the commission and the uh, chair of this committee. Uh, we have Brandon Hilpert, who is the uh, chair of the commission and an ex official member of the committee, a Nancy Vaughn committee member, a Diana Dent committee member. Um, Patrick Anderson committee member. Uh, we have Kate Yevendetti, who is our liaison with San Diegans for Justice. We have Henry Foster, who is the chief of staff for a council district four. Um, and we have um, Jarman Mosley, our um, interim executive director. And do we have uh, our executive assistant uh, coming to uh, take minutes today? Yeah, she's coming. She's having trouble with log logging on. She has okay. an old laptop, so. Okay. Um, well, I guess in the worst case, she could watch the uh, yes. YouTube to uh, do, do the minutes. Okay. And uh, and we received no public comment. Uh, and Charmaine and uh, Brandon have to uh, jump to another meeting. Uh, do either of you have anything you want to report on um, before you have to leave? No, I, I have no um, new updates. Um, I've been working with PNC, which is purchasing and contracting department this past week on finalizing the RFP. So that's, um, we're making some progress with that. And any, any new information on funding options for the uh, uh, search process for the deputy assistant director? No, I reached out to the OF, I haven't, Department of Finance, and I haven't heard back from them yet. So I'll let you know as soon as I find out something. Okay. And uh, Brandon, do you have anything before you jump off? I have no updates, no. Okay. And actually, I think uh, there's not a whole lot in terms of update, nothing in terms of budget, uh, the staffing process. Uh, actually, where are we in terms of the administrative assistant? Are we waiting? Yes, I have not heard back from um, HR on the out-of-class assignments on whether we should proceed with that yet. I'll follow up with them. Okay, and um, nothing new on office space, uh, the standing rules. So the rules committee did meet immediately after our meeting last week. And uh, we have a proposal for a bylaws change in our public meeting next week uh, that would uh, change the quorum so that a quorum would be a uh, majority of the uh, filled seats on the board uh, with a minimum number of uh, seven. Uh, to uh, conduct business, just in case our numbers uh, were to continue to to drop, we would have a minimum number. And um, and I did also realize that as I was reading the uh, notes from last week's meeting that I said that I would check uh, with our outside legal consultant to find out whether or not uh, operational standing rules uh, adopted by the city council, quote, have the force of law. Oh, there's Elena now, so good. Uh, uh, and uh, I forgot to do that. Uh, and so I will do that this week. And that was with regard to uh, our mapping out of uh, investigation procedures. Okay, and so our major item of business uh, today is talking about uh, the uh, allocation of seats on the commission. And uh, this was an assignment uh, for Patrick. And so Patrick, we'll let you uh, take it away. Okay, so I, uh, Henry and I had a meeting a couple days ago to talk about, hi Alina, it's good to see you, um, to talk about um, this part of the um, ordinance. And just to refresh everyone's memory, uh, so the current sort of working model of the ordinance is that there will be 25 commissioners, two of whom are dedicated youth seats defined as 18 to 24, nine of whom are designated uh, representatives of city council districts. So that's 11 of the 25 that are designated seats. 
In our meeting two weeks ago, um, as we were trying to sort out how to ensure that various diverse representation, uh, various kinds of diverse representation on uh, for the remainder of those um, 25 seats, um, Henry raised an important set of concerns, which was around the use of the word designation, essentially. If a seat is a designated seat in terms of who and um, which community, which part of San Diego, which um, constituency and so on, uh, if it's designated as a defined representative, then it must stay that way. It's not flexible in terms of how the city thinks about uh, charter language. Um, oh, looks like we lost Alina, but it sounds like there are tech issues. Um, and so I started thinking about, uh, and I, I, I also spoke with Doug about this, um, uh, how to how to frame the language that we recommend so that so that we distinguish between those um, eleven designated seats and then. Um, representation on the other 14 seats. Um, the, the CPP concern about this is, you know, there's sort of two competing concerns. One of them is um, we need to do a better job and we need to be more thoughtful and rigorous about how we represent diverse experiences and diverse expertise in the community. And then the competing concern is that historically it has been very difficult to fill seats um, and to uh, uh, ensure that we have quorum, that we have a fully staffed commission uh, in terms of um, the number of commissioners. That's not to say that people in the community don't want to be uh, on the commission, that they don't want to represent their various communities in this important work but rather that the process of nominating, appointing, confirming, background checks, and so on, there, there are multiple roadblocks that have made it difficult to keep the commission fully staffed. In my conversation with Henry a couple of days ago, um, uh, well, let me, let me back up again. So two weeks ago when I proposed uh, some new language for, for how to do this, um, Henry suggested that one of the things that council member Montgomery steps office has been doing is focusing on including explicitly including the uh, the input of people who have lived experience um, with policing with over policing um, with incarceration um, and with other aspects of the criminal justice system. That reminded me of, of one of the communities uh, recommendations you know, months ago during the community roundtables, um, uh, which was that we also include representation of people with expertise in some of San Diego's most pressing challenges, addiction treatment, mental health, um, uh, uh, the unhoused community, and social work more generally, approaching um, crises in people's lives from a social work perspective, um, uh, as uh, as a part of the work that the commission does. Um, so one of the things that it sounds like uh, what I understood Henry to be saying is that council member Montgomery steps office has been focus on, focusing on ensuring that there are no barriers uh, for, for example, people with um, uh, criminal records, people with a history of incarceration, that there are no barriers wholesale from those folks being represented um, or from, from being appointed as commissioners. Um, now, right after Measure B passed, uh, one of the first things we did at the community's um, urging was to remove language in the old bylaws um, about that was barring uh, people with felony convictions, people with misdemeanor convictions, and this vague language of the moral turpitude um, we got rid of as much of that language as state law permits us to get rid of um, uh, from our bylaws, and the community was very happy with that. We, of course, as uh, the council members um, office believes, we need to ensure that there are no other barriers in the process either, so that those going through background checks um, uh, and other forms of council review 
are not systematically and categorically excluded because of their history. And we want to make sure of that because it's important that the commission include includes representation um, uh, by those people who've had that direct experience with various aspects of the criminal justice system. Okay, this is a long preamble to say that this, this issue has gone through numerous permutations. And, um, you know, over several months, I reviewed SDPD data and historical CRB data to see if there was a way to drill down to beat level representation or SDPD division level representation. But this committee, uh, or uh, yeah, this committee was, was resistant to designating any further seats to beats or divisions because it would make it would make it very difficult to maintain uh, full membership of the commission. So I'm going to share screen um, with some text that I brought a couple weeks ago and um, that I revised in preparation for today. I want to make sure I click the right window uh, so you don't see my private email. Let's see here. Okay, are you seeing a Word document? No, we're seeing a very salacious uh, personal email. I'm not just kidding. <laughs> Douglas Case, <laughs> I am going to send you. Can someone make me a host so I can send him to a waiting room? Okay, so we're using language here that was drafted. Okay, so um, in the city attorney's draft uh, of the ordinance that was released um, uh, last month, uh, a couple of months ago, um, uh, the the that draft had sort of designated um, low income census tracts as being a potential way to designate more seats to ensure socioeconomic diversity um, on the commission. The, the issue with that is that, first of all, the census tracts don't map onto those part, you know, those beats, the, those police beats in San Diego that experience the highest. Uh, you know, the, the highest rate of warrantless contacts and so on. They, they just don't, those two sets of mapping uh, of, of data maps are not overlapping. And so it doesn't quite get us to what the community wanted us to try to achieve. An added issue is it increases the number of so-called designated seats, which means we run right back into the problem of having so many designated seats that it becomes difficult to um, actually keep the commission staffed without running searches and appointment processes constantly. So I had originally recommended this language two weeks ago. Um, and a reminder that this number here, uh, this section and subsection number is relative to the uh, voters ordinance drafted uh, by community members in response to the first draft. So it's not, um, it's not necessarily going to stay that way, but the, the data named in that section has to do with um, data that the measure, that measure B requires the police department to make available transparently, regularly, and expeditiously um, to the commission. It also includes data that the commission is mandated to collect and disseminate on complaints, um, findings, and so on. So the idea here was that any, uh, when I drafted this, um, this thing first, is that rather than sort of looking at seats on the commission as a whole and trying to proportionally figure everything out, um, what this language was trying to do is to say, any time a vacancy comes up on the commission, um, the commission would be required to begin its um, search for nominations by seeking nominations from residents living within the boundaries of police rates with the highest rate um, of warrantless stops. And it then further sort of lays out that process by saying that if the beat with the highest rate is already represented by an existing commissioner, they'll just sort of go down the list and if the top 10 beats 
in terms of warrant rates of warrantless stops are already represented by an existing commissioner, then they can proceed with nominations from any other uh, any other part of San Diego. Henry's concern uh, at our meeting two weeks ago is that th it's this language, um, especially uh, this this language right here. If the top ten beats are already represented by existing commissioners, and his concern is that that makes it sound like these are designated seats, designated to the top ten beats in any given year, and that's what we want to get away from. The idea behind you know this draft of of the language um, is that it's mandating that the commission nominating committee prioritize this process and then it lays out how the process may proceed all right so um i've i've tried to redraft this taking out some of that language so there's no confusion about designated seats this is simply about the nominating process um, and the priorities that the nominating committee would be mandated to use um, in filling any vacancies. And I also, um, in this section, brought back some of that language that, we, that had fallen by the wayside about ensuring representation from subject matter experts. So now, and okay, so I'll just say up front, my concerns about this is that as we're doing this, I feel like we're, I, I'm, I'm worried that we're watering down or getting further away from the very um, very insistent community feedback that we must include this um, more robust and more rigorous form of representing the various diversities of San Diego. So that's my concern here. Um, but what I've recommended, uh, so how I've redrafted the language is here. When vacancies on the commission arise, the commission nominating committee shall prioritize representation from first SDPD beats that experience the highest rates of warrantless stops and searches using data collected as directed by that section Two, system impacted community members and their families. And this I don't uh, you know, I'm not quite sure what the correct language is here, but this is um, a phrase that's responding to Henry's um, telling us a couple of weeks ago that the that uh, council member Montgomery steps office is prioritizing again people who have a history um, with uh, policing and incarceration without you know we it wouldn't be legal for us to require anything about a police record or incarceration um, as part of the process um, so that's the second uh, bullet point. Third, community members with training and experience in addiction treatment, homeless ex homelessness services, and this language is clunky, so you know it can get worked out. Immigrant and migrant services, mental health, and/or social work. So again, this is just a draft. Um, I'm trying to let it evolve organically as these discussions um, continue, um, but. Uh, you know, this is this is where I've gotten to so far. So I invite criticism, um, comment about how I've gone wrong, anything you think can be salvaged from this. Um, yeah. Well, let me make uh, three points and then I'll open up to others. Um, the language talks about uh, when vacancies arise, and I think that that's good to have, but we also need to look at the composition of the initial permanent commission. Um, uh, secondly, as I indicated uh, two weeks ago, I have some concerns about limiting uh, the criteria to warrantless uh, stops and searches because there's a lot of other types of data that uh, are indications of uh, uh, over policing or people you know, highly impacted by policing. Um, yep. I don't have the answer to that, uh, but I don't. I think that's too limiting. Um, I'm not sure what system impacted community members means. Does that mean? Um, yeah. So, uh, first of all, this is a placeholder. I remembered that language, and I haven't worked it out completely. It looks like Kate has <laughs> her hand up too. Okay, um, I'll call on her next. Uh, yeah. yeah. System so, system impacted is a sort of 
community way of talking about people who've been incarcerated, people who've been affected by over-policing. It's not the right language for this ordinance. It's a placeholder for now to indicate how uh, the council member's office is prioritizing this work. Okay, and then uh, I might add to the uh, number three, uh, people with experience in the criminal justice system. Uh, so if you have somebody, for example, who is a uh, expert in police oversight, uh, that might be somebody you want to include. So uh, there may be some other areas of expertise, uh, but I would add uh, criminal justice uh, in addition to the list of things you have there. And so that now I can see who has their hands up. Uh, Kate had her hand up visually. Oh, oh okay. no, she, I was just seeing a waving hand. Never mind. Okay, because uh, I, I, I can't see anybody's faces on my screen. And it, uh, so Kate doesn't want to say anything. Um, yeah, I, okay, I changed my mind. No, I have my <laughs> hand up just because I, I have arthritis, you know, in my hands. And so I have to like do this a lot. Um, I guess I have a more general question. And it, it sort of was percolating in my head after the last meeting. And that is... Um, and I may have misheard this and Henry can correct me, but I thought Henry was saying that their office is working on uh, basically rewriting the city attorney's draft ordinance based on the five or six things that came out of the PSNLN committee meeting. And so it's not clear to me um, how much um, all of the work that the CPP is doing on rewriting things is being um, taken into account or being actually used or added into that process. I guess that's sort of my first question. And, this, and the second thing I would say about this thing specifically is I think it's remarkable, the work that, that Patrick has done. And, and if we just wanna um, you know, change some of the language a little bit, I, I think that's fine. I did have a question about the previous draft, but that's, gone so i'm not even going to go to that question okay um so i'm not sure where the first question maybe is directed uh, toward uh toward henry or did you want somebody else to respond to that i, I guess i just don't know because um i know that the cpp sent a whole lot of um comments on the initial draft and um but what i heard was frankly thank you but no thanks we're going to do it ourselves and so i'm i'm interested in seeing how how much uh the cpp's work is being taken into account in the new in whatever is coming out of d4 and and if d4 is really doing the rewriting or if they're waiting for the new council, independent council to do that. I, I'm just, I just have questions about the process. Well, I, I, the, what, what I can clarify on is anything that comes over as a written memorandum um, to our office, we, we look at and take into consideration. Um, at the end of the day, you can go through and see what made it in, what didn't, um, what we took um, changed trying to, to maintain the, the same intent. Um, so anything that we get, um, we look at and, um, and, and consider. Um, so hope, I hope that answers your question. I'm not, <laughs> I, I guess I'm not here. I think this is my third or fourth meeting. Um, I'm not here to um, placate or, or, or kind of go through an exercise per se. Um, and, and so we are listening, we are taking the comments and um, we are reviewing those and, um, you know, in contact with um, our attorneys. Um, what else, what's the second part of the, what else did you have for, for, for me? Um, well, I guess part I, question? I mean, my, yeah, my, my second part of the question was, is I thought you said that you were, that, that your office was also doing 
some rewrite of the ordinance based on what came out of PSNLN. And I was wondering if, how, how is that gonna coordinate with the new independent legal council that will eventually be chosen? And is that so, just gonna to go to that so council the, or is the council kind of writing the ordinance on their own or, or sort of- Well, the council will, the, the council will receive the work in, the, the, the work that, that has been done um, to date. And then um, they will do their, um, I'm assuming they will do their initial analysis. Um, and, and then um, we will provide um, our feedback, all the things that we have been, that we're, work, that we're currently working on. Um, and then they will go through and um, based on our guidance, go through and um, come back with a, another, um, I'm going to call it another draft. And then if I could also maybe respond to some of Kate's concerns. Uh, we are meeting uh, and have met uh, twice now with all of the members of PSNLN, including uh, Chair uh, Montgomery Stepp. Um, and we went over all of the commission's uh, concerns regarding uh, the first draft uh, she was receptive to some of our concerns, uh, others that she had questions about, uh, and so, in some cases, disagreements with our concerns. And um, we had an open and frank discussion. And actually, as a result of that, we've had Henry come to these meetings to, so we can try to clarify issues uh, <clears throat> as our committee uh, you know, continues making its recommendations. Um, and, uh, and we will continue to uh, engage uh, members of the PSNLN on uh, on our recommendations and you know eventually the entire city council when it uh, when it gets that far uh, but I found uh, so far that all of the uh, city council members have been very interested in uh, in our recommendations it doesn't mean everybody's in agreement with everything we're recommending uh, but all of them seem to be taking uh, seriously our concerns um Doug, I have a, I just have a comment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Henry and I had a very, uh, very helpful meeting on Wednesday um, uh, and friendly meeting. I mean, it was, uh, Henry, it was nice to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. We've never, we've never spoken one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I was thinking uh, afterwards, because I, this interesting thing happened where, um, you know, we were we started riffing, talking about all the various state laws and lack of certain state laws that le that have led to California being a very specific state when it when it comes to this kind of work, an almost eccentric <laughs> state. For example, one of the things that came up is that California is one of a surprising small group of states that does not have decertification legislation or um, policies for offending officers. Um, I think there are five states that don't have uh, a decertification process and California is one of them. So in other words, if an officer is found guilty of serious misconduct, there's no process that's systematized by which that officer can be kept from getting another police job in another jurisdiction, right? California is one of only five or six states that don't have a process. Um, so if I could intervene, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me get, cause I know what you're about to say. Um, Henry and I, so Henry and I started talking about this and then I went, so the NACOL conference is happening and I went to NACOL right after my meeting with Henry and the entire session that day was about this very thing. And what it reminded me of is that, you know, there are a lot of boards and commissions. There are a lot of committees that the city has. But the CP, there's something very specific about the CPP. It's not just another committee. Oversight is actually, you know, it's almost like journalism. It's a highly professionalized field with its own credentials, its own training, its own best practices. NACOL is this national organization that, you know, it isn't just networking. It's actually developed the research on oversight on what works and what doesn't in different kinds of jurisdictions. Um, and so, Henry, I'm, I'm intending, since we had had that conversation, I'm going to send you the materials from that once they get uh, sent out by NACOL. 
Um, but it reminded me that this is an opportunity, you know, it's a, it's CPP is just a weird little board and, uh, or a weird little committee in that it's connected to a profession, essentially, um, even though it's a volunteer profession. And I just want to offer to the, to all of the council members and, and especially to D4 who have taken leadership on this. Um, I want to offer that those of us on this commission who are going to NACOL, who go every year, are happy to report back and share on specific issues about Measure B and the new ordinance um, that NACOL has done, you know, training and research on and collected a lot of data on. Um, I was reminded of this because of this weird uh, synchronicity and sort of serendipity between my conversation with Henry and then the very topic we talked about Kate, was the topic of NACOL that day. Um, so that's in response to Kate's question too, that I, I think we would love to share the, the more formalized, professionalized side of this work that actually does have, that can help with the, with the ordinance um, writing. Okay, Doug, sorry. Yeah, what I was going to say is that may soon change in California. Uh, there is a bill in the, um, uh, well, currently it's in the assembly. Uh, it's uh, SB2, uh, authored by uh, Senator Bradford from the Los Angeles area and uh, Senate President Pro Tem uh, Tony Atkins as a co author, or actually a joint author. Uh, it has passed the state Senate, it is now in the assembly, um, and it would do what Patrick uh, just, you know, just said. Um, and I think that there is a, a committee meeting coming up soon, maybe it was even this past week in the assembly, and so you may want to keep track of that. I've, I've heard uh, that there is a lot of uh, pressure being put on assembly members uh, by law enforcement unions in the state uh, to uh, oppose or modify the, the bill, but uh, there is a good possibility uh, that uh, that California will not be one of the five after the current uh, legislative session. Um, going back to our topic of uh, Patrick's draft, and I, I agree with Kate, I think that I like this a lot better with the pro provisions that, uh, or caveats that I previously mentioned, uh, but I wanna give anybody else an opportunity to, uh, to weigh in. And I see you highlighting the things that we need uh, yeah, I'm just highlighting the two things that you brought up and that I did add criminal justice. I think that needs a bit more specificity because that's such a broad phrase and can include, for example, it could include police officers, which other parts of the ordinance um, mitigate. Uh, but I, you know, so I'm just highlighting it. But yeah, those are the three areas that have been well, that another need, need work. Another thing, and this, and this depends on what direction the uh, uh, next the city council draft takes. Um, you know, our recommendation was that there be a nominating committee of the um, CPP who develops the uh, nominations for the uh, city council. Um, this language um, um, takes that approach uh, if the uh, ultimate ordinance doesn't uh, specify that the uh, CPP has a responsibility to have a nominating committee, we may need to change, or that part of the uh, uh, section would need to be changed. Um, and, and we can still within our own bylaws have that language, but I think we want to have the language in the ordinance. And so even if the city council itself um, makes the uh, selection, we wanna make sure two things. Number one, that the city council takes these things into consideration and utilizes the same thing. And two, that it's not, it doesn't apply to just vacancies, but on the initial composition of the commission. And, and I have a question, it's just that I don't remember, but the, the nominating committee that the CPP is talking about also includes community members, is that correct? That's correct. And we, and we made a couple of, uh, modifications to the proposal that uh, San Diegans for Justice had, but it was very similar to the one that San Diegans for Justice had. Um, and, um, but we need to keep in mind that that may be something that we need to 
to address, we don't know for certain at this point in time, what the next version of the, uh, the ordinance uh, will have. Uh, anybody besides uh, Kate that uh, wants to respond to Patrick? Do you like it? You don't like it? Do you have any concerns? Okay, and I'm gonna do what instructors do in class and call on people. So uh, Nancy, what is your opinion of um, Patrick's uh, approach? Well, I always appreciate Patrick's approach. Uh, the one thing that I'm the most concerned with with this whole process is that we are allowed to keep CPP full of members regardless of whether or not we can actually satisfy um, any specific requirements. I, I worry a lot that if we're required to have nine people from nine different areas in the city, that if we can't get four of those to give us people who are qualified and want to do this work, that we will be without four people on the commission. And that's, to me, that's unacceptable. There has to be a default. There has to be a way of making sure that a designated seat isn't an absolute designation. So that is my main concern. And having members on this commission is what's the most important as we are finding out in spades right now. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I think politically the city council will insist on having a, a designated person from each, uh, each district. And I think there'll be pressure from the community on them to make sure their district is represented. But I do, I do hear that that's been a, uh, was certainly an issue with the CPP as we had, um, districts uh, where we had uh, vacancies and uh, and we could not uh, yeah we can't fill them and, and, and we couldn't fill them part of that was because uh, there were recommendations made by council members uh, that were rejected by the mayor's office somebody has their hand up uh, oh that's just you nancy okay I'm uh, sorry. that's okay uh, and so uh, diana what's your opinion do you like the general approach of the language the revised language that patrick has come up with i do i i do like the um the language you know i'm just a number I'm, I'm because the pictures are there so this number two is the, the you know of course is already highlighted but that was certainly something that kind of bothered me but you know other than that um just to you know just for my own clarification you said homeless services I mean, you know, so what, and I was thinking homeless outreach. So is there, you know, I'm just happy to make that change. Yeah. This, this language is very clunky. I was trying to fit in, um, uh, because I know homeless outreach goes out to, you know, to churches and to other organizations, you know, one of which that I'm, that I work with as well. So, um, yeah, I'm, I think all of this language needs a bit of sort of clarifying. I think actually the people who would be best able to tell us what this language should actually be are people who are the subject matter experts. There you go. Um, so we could ask uh, one of the other commissioners, uh, Andrea Dauber Griffin, who works in this area, for example, to help us actually name these things the way uh, they're supposed to be named in a document like this. So I'll just highlight this whole phrase. Um, and, and I see a, a a chat from Charmaine uh, suggesting language of uh, unsheltered rather than homeless. Yeah, and we may also, you know, outreach may not be the best word. You know, in some cases, somebody who is uh, formerly unsheltered uh, may have that expertise, even though they don't work for an agency that currently deals with. Uh, I'm yeah, I'm just not sure how to do this, but I think if we. Um, if we talk to somebody who is a subject matter expert, they'll be able to tell us exactly what the phrase should be. Thank you for that, Diana. Okay, and uh, Brandon. Um, I missed a good chunk of uh, the okay. conversation because I was on another call, but I, I think from previous conversations, I think we're all pretty much more or less in alignment. So I, I won't have any comments on this right now. Okay. So I get everybody. So it sounds like we have a general consensus on the approach uh, and uh, need to uh, tighten up the 
or clarify the language in some of the sections. And so um, I'll return this assignment back to Patrick. For, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll reach out to Commissioner Dauber Griffin um, to get her help on, on framing out some of this stuff. I know she, when we were drafting the, one of the job ads, um, she was really helpful with that. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll do that and bring it back to the committee. Okay, and thank you, Patrick, for such a, an outstanding job of working on that. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so the other item of unfinished business uh, was what we worked on last week, which was deciding what aspects of investigations should uh, go into uh, um, the ordinance, uh, the, the operation, the standard operating procedures and the commission's uh, internal documents uh, and encourage people to uh, look at it further and give me any thoughts or updates. And as I indicated, I haven't had a chance to follow up yet uh, with our outside counsel to ask that question that was asked last week, which I think is critical. And that is, uh, does uh, do the standard operating procedures have the force of law? Because that could make an impact on which, which should go into to which document. Um, Andrea St. Julian, was interested in participating in that discussion last week. Um, and I think uh, I may have screwed up because I assumed that the, uh, as did she, that the link is available for the online for the meeting, uh, but I think you have to be sent the link uh, and I didn't ask Charmaine to do that. And uh, so I, I did send her the document and ask for her feedback. Um, and so, uh, and I suspect uh, knowing Andrea, she'll have some feedback. And so we can discuss that next week. And I don't know if anybody else had any further thoughts after last week's meeting. Uh, no, but that your, your comment just raised a, a reminder question. And that is, um, I think Andrea and all the others of us had assumed that this was a, a meeting open to the public, but it apparently is not. Is that accurate? Because it's an ad hoc, yeah, ad -hoc an ad committee? It's an ad hoc committee under the uh, under the Brown Act, we made the decision early on to uh, post uh, committee agendas, which isn't required, and to uh, um, post um, the uh, recordings of the meeting. Um, and they had the ability for people to submit comments uh, via web form. And so we provided those opportunities for, for transparency, but it's not, it's not the same as a uh, regular committee meeting, uh, which I think we have to post the uh, have to post the link. And so uh, I'll make sure that the, any meeting that Andrea wishes to attend in the future, uh, okay. even though even though we have a capable representation from Kate here, <laughs> if Andrea wants to come in person. No, I mean, it, it just raised a question because I think she was dismayed to find out that she couldn't just link in. And um, it never occurred to me that this wasn't like every other meeting that people could um, you know, would be able to access just like we do the regular CPP meetings. And so then my, my secondary part of that is, is it possible to make that uh, available to the public? Not that I'm believing that a whole lot of public members are interested in attending these meetings, but is it like an absolute no, it can't happen? Or is it up to the committee to decide whether or not it's public? And I think we'd have to set it up in the, uh, I forget what it's called, but the, uh, Webinar. Webinar, thing. webinar. Yeah, webinar. Uh, and that, which is how we do our uh, other open meetings. Um, and so it, maybe sure our main can weigh in on whether that's a possibility. Uh, Set it up. We get the meeting. However, the committee has to decide on, you know, when the agenda has to be posted, it has to be posted in a timely fashion. Sometimes we have a fast turnaround time where we can't get the agenda posted in a timely fashion. So um, it's up to the committee. How do you want to proceed? Yeah, because, well, I mean, I guess, though, I mean, the legal, the, the timing of when it has to be posted is determined by the Brown Act and we're exempt from the Brown Act. But it doesn't mean that we can't have a webinar and have an agenda that's posted 48 hours instead of 72 hours. Uh, it, would remain, it would remain an ad hoc committee, not a standing. Yeah, committee. so it would remain an ad hoc committee, but it doesn't mean that we can't uh, be more inclusive than what's required by law. And so I don't That's have any fine. problem with that. I'm fine with that. Okay. Uh, Just remind me. Just my, remind my only me. concern, 
<laughs> I, I, my only concern, and I, I, I'm totally open to, to having it be open and all that, is I could just see someone not understanding the difference between a regular open session meeting and an ad hoc meeting and someone saying, you're not posting your agendas on time. I, I can see that coming up as something that, that I mean, we'll have to do a bit of education to explain what that is and maybe put that in the agenda, but I could see that becoming an issue where someone's like, you're not doing what you need to do per Brown Act, even though, as Doug pointed out, you know, ad hoc meetings are, are exempt from that. I think that, that's, that's a that's aspect. a fair point, and if we, we can, um, it's a it's a it's an important point. And if we just write a couple sentences to include at the top of every agenda, reminder that this is not a, a an open meeting of the full commission. This is an ad hoc committee meeting, um, and so you know, just a sentence or two at the top to demystify that a bit. Yeah, and so I I agree, um, and and it isn't. I mean, other committee me meetings are required to be open. The issue is whether or not it's a standing committee or an ad hoc committee as defined by the Brown Act. Okay, um, so um, we'll do that. Then I'll get back to Andrea and let her know that we'll make that change so that uh, people who are interested in participating uh, can, you know, can do so in the future. Um, and uh, I hate to, finished 10 minutes early, but <laughs> we don't, uh, are there anything, um, well, maybe we ought to talk about what we'd like, well, for, actually one thing is that the next week I do have a conflict. Uh, I have to meet uh, with, uh, I have a meeting uh, with a pro Tim Atkins and a candidate uh, scheduled, she's scheduled for next, uh, next Friday at, uh, at 10. Um, and so, uh, can I suggest that we take a week off then? Um, I'm okay with that. Does anybody else uh, feel like pressing need to meet next week? And then the, uh, I guess the uh, second part of that question is uh, moving forward for the, uh, at least for the duration of the uh, NACOL conference. Uh, does meeting at 9.30 uh, work for people? Obviously it works for people that are here and Joe didn't respond. So I don't know whether Joe has a, a conflict or not. Um, okay, uh, I think we have a consensus then. So we will take next week off and then our subsequent meetings, uh, at least through uh, the NACO conference and the late NACO conference goes through, uh, actually I think that the, uh, it goes just through September because I think the first Friday in October will be after the conference. And so for the next uh, month, um, anyway, and, until the end of the NACO conference, we'll meet at 930 and then we can go back to our to our standard noon. So I, I have a question unrelated because I, I think I missed it when Charmaine was speaking. Um, she said something about an RFP and I was wondering about the status of the RFP for outside counsel. If anybody has an update on that. And is that come out of the city attorney's office or con or contract and purchasing or where that is? The RFP comes out of the purchasing and contracting department. I worked on some of the um, revisions this week and it's back in their court. So um, we're making progress on the um, the RFP. I do not have a time frame as to when it will be released though. Wait, that's for the outside attorney, Charmaine. You're yeah. you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. And then um, we want to. Uh, well, maybe. Um, Not every week. So I think in our next meeting we can come back and visit the two items on today's agenda, because uh, I'm sure everybody will spend their two weeks uh, diligently uh, researching and uh, so forth. But no, seriously, we can put those two back items back on the agenda. Is there? Looking over the um, items for future agendas, um, I'm, I'm looking at what things might are important to be included in the um, um, in the ordinance. And well, three things here, which are GH and I. If you have a copy of your agenda up of future agenda items. Uh, G is procedures for making recommendations to the SDPD and requirements for an SDPD response. H is the deadlines uh, for PD to transmit cases to a CPP for review. 
in consideration of the POBAR deadline. And I is a procedure for a CPP to receive documents and data from uh, SDPD. Um, and I think all of those are, are relevant for either the ordinance or the uh, another one of our documents. And so unless there's an objection, why don't I put those three items in the order that I listed them on uh, our agenda for new business uh, in, two in two weeks, which would be uh, then uh, Friday, uh, September the 3rd, that'll be the Friday before Labor Day, but that doesn't make any difference to me. Does anybody else have a problem with uh, Labor Day weekend? Okay, seeing none, then we will, that'll be our plan. And uh, we will adjourn uh, six minutes early. And, uh, and I'll see several of you behind the scenes at the uh, NACL seminar coming up in, uh, in half an hour. Uh, today should be interesting, an interesting one. It deals with white supremacy and uh, law enforcement, so. Absolutely. I think it, it was interesting as well. With well, yeah, it was yeah, very, very much so. Um, and, and yeah, yesterday was able training, the active by bystander <laughs> training. Um, that's there. There's now a national network of training that's developed with community members, former law enforcement officers, leadership, um, and various social services groups. Um, Henry, again, a sort of open offer. If the if the council member would like or her office would like to see um, some of the data. Um, and if it sees an opportunity to include some of this in the drafting of the ordinance, just reach out. I'm happy to share. Um, I'm sure any of us are happy to send on anything we get from NACOL. Yeah. Well, and also for Henry and Kate, uh, the NACOL sessions, well, there's the conference this year is in two part. There is the virtual conference, which is basically hour and a half seminars almost every day, Monday through Friday, with a few exceptions between now and September. Uh, and then there is the in-person conference in December. Um, but the individual sessions, uh, you can you can pay to attend an individual session. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I, I assume that uh, since we have an institutional membership, uh, they probably can get the uh, NACOL rate if they maybe were to go through us. Uh, anyway, how, Charmaine, do you know, do you recall how much it is for an individual individual session? Fifteen dollars. Yeah, so it's it's fairly uh, inexpensive, uh, and you can also review them after the fact, so you don't actually have to attend it. Uh, the uh, the seminars will be available for. Uh, viewing until uh, the end of the calendar year. And so if there's a particular session that you were interested in, you could, I think you could still register for it and then uh, um, go back and watch uh, the video. Or if there's one you're interested in and can't make it on the scheduled time, you can register for it. And then you're sending a link uh, to the video uh, afterwards so you can uh, watch it at your leisure. And they also will send you a copy of the PowerPoints and other uh, documents that were used in there. So it's, um, Anybody who's interested, I would encourage you to do so. And uh, with that, we will still adjourn three minutes early. So have a good uh, weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. If you could stay on, Alina. Yes. <laughs>